first talk is uh, Rick Arends. Um, <coughs> he will be talking about WebGL and his uh, build, uh, his editor he built. Uh, well, I'll uh, I'll let you do the further introduction. And, uh, All right. Um, okay, so there is a, a fair amount of uh, context um, to this talk. Um, part of that uh, I've done in my uh, JSConf talk last year, uh, explaining uh, what I'm building, but I'll try to make a very condensed version of that uh, in this talk as well. And um, then uh, talk about the progress that I've been making uh, for the editor. So the project that I'm working on is called OneJS, and the editor is uh, built for OneJS. And OneJS is uh, simply JavaScript with some features that I needed uh, to make the GPU accessible directly from Jav JavaScript. And um, because why do we want the GPU accessible from JavaScript? Note that this horrible frame rate is because of the screen recorder. Normally it's really nice and tight. <laughs> As a GPU guy, that bugs me incredibly, but that's okay. Um, but why is it important to access the GPU from uh, JavaScript? Because it allows you to style things using shaders. And uh, I don't know how many of you have played around on Shader Toy and, and looked at what you can write in a simple shader. You can write Doom in a shader. You can write Ray Tracers in a shader. You can do pretty much anything in a shader to style uh, uh, your UI, except that's not used anywhere at all um, because everybody uses CSS and the browser renders using an ancient C++ render engine that at most uses textures. But it has the entire... Uh, uh Scala of the computation that's available on the GPU uh, unused. And if you want to bridge the gap between JavaScript and the GPU, you have to add some things to JavaScript to make that nice. And the project to do that, that I've uh, booted up, is OneJS, and it adds, um, it adds the features to the language that you need to make the uh, GPU accessible. And I want to quickly stop over the first principles that I'm uh, observing. Uh, first principles are these kind of rules that you can stick on the wall and look at every now and again when you're doing something and see if you're still playing by it. And it's usually, they give very interesting results uh, if, you, uh, if you apply them. For instance, programmable goes beyond configurable. Uh, so if you find yourself in a situation where you can make something configurable, see if you can make it programmable instead. This is a very uh, a, a rule that is continuously violated all over the place, if you follow it. Um, but it is incredibly powerful, because instead of trying to make everything configurable, like CSS, like, hey, now the background color is red. Well, no, here's a program to decide the background color. Then it is programmable and not configurable. Um, so, uh, of course, the boundaries of this rule are, are kind of strange, especially if you go into declarative structures, because configurable systems are simpler, right? Because the only parameters that are there are the config parameters that you provide to it. If it's programmable, all of a sudden, the testing domain has become uh, very, very problematic. But that doesn't really matter. It's more about the principle and can we maximize uh, the programmability? Um, this is another one that is uh, style and behavior are irreducible, which is, uh, um, this is about uh, encoding uh, uh, certain problems, right? So if you're saying that a rectangle is red, you have to say that it's a rectangle and you have to say that it's red. You cannot reduce the data any, any much more than that, that statement. So uh, this uh, uh, rule essentially states that you need to find composability in everything you do, otherwise you will not be able to make your UI toolkit or your styling toolkit um, in optimal uh, compression. Um, and this is a really cool one. Everybody's used to JavaScript being slow. Well, if you can do uh, inefficient things in parallel, then all of a sudden you can do a lot more things that you would normally find uh, incomprehensible if you think of them as, as like playing with canvas and doing pixel loops, shaders can do a million trillion of those and it would be fine. I'll show you that in relation to the code editor. Um, so let's see if I can show you. Um, 
So this is the, the the render model of OneJS, right? So we don't have a browser. We don't. We don't. We have a browser, but we don't have a DOM. We don't have Canvas. All we have is shader programs, data, and a, and a frame buffer, right? A frame buffer is a bit bucket of pixels that you see on your screen, and the vertex data is in this case the uh, the array that describes the coordinates of the the four corners of this triangle, and uh, then there's a program that decides the color of the pixel of that triangle. So if you're trying to reduce how to describe uh, a scene that is transported to a modern WebGL uh, or a modern GPU, which means vertex shaders, pixel shaders, and data, this is pretty much it. You know, I can rip off some curlies and make it uh, white space sensitive, but that's about it. Um, you essentially define a vertex expression. In this case, it just passes through the data, and you define a pixel expression. In this case, it says mix from orange to blue using the Y coordinate in the data, right? This is an expression, but this can also be a function. This can also be, uh, as we see here, um, this can also be fractals or whatever you can do in a shader. Everything you can see on shader toy, you can run on uh, in these expressions, right? Um, the problem right now with those shaders, though, is if you look at Shader Toy, they're like giant blobs of text. They are not composable as a language. They are, you can paste them together using string concatenation and pass them to the API. That's pretty much it. They do not form composable structures uh, as in like, hey, let's include this library and call this function and, you know, let's compose. The composability of shaders is currently not there unless you use an external uh, solution which currently are not much beyond, essentially, uh, simple preprocessors. So you can look at uh, OneJS in a way that, um, essentially, it allows you to mix the preprocessing of the shader into the programming language that you're using in JavaScript. Let me show you a little example of... So the syntax has changed a little bit since my presentation. But here I say st the method style using, uh, maybe I should make it bigger, um, using the escape operator. And the escape operator is a, is a feature that I added to JavaScript. It's like the Lisp quote. Uh, it allows you to escape uh, an expression and allow it to return the AST node. Now, how many of you know what an AST node is? Okay, so ASTs, abstract syntax trees, are essentially the data structure that you convert your source code into that the compiler can use to execute it or, you know, compile it further down into the machine, into assembly or transform it or do whatever with it. At least it's the, it's not a, it's the source code of, of a program is not, to the compiler is not text, it's parsed from text, and then it generates a structure, and in this structure, you can navigate and quickly uh, reorder, manipulate, do those kind of things. And for JavaScript, uh, there is uh, an AST, the Mozilla AST uh, definition. It's essentially, it's sort of a JSON structure that just says like, hey, we have an ID node, and it has a name property, and we have a value node, and it's or an array node, this, is an ar th this represents a, an array literal, this represents an object literal. Now, in the Mozilla uh, AST, they're like, they use huge words. So I made my own and I shortened everything because I use the AST a lot. I use it a lot. So I want th these things to be as close to the the language as as possible so i uh, i took the mozilla ast definition and reduced it and simplified it until it looked much more recognizable to me so this is a while node this is a do while node it's very simple this is the this is my uh, sort of my uh, type definition of the ast right asts are json structures and uh or uh, object structures and um if you want to make a function that walks through the whole tree in a generic way, you have to know which properties there are on the node, right? You go, 
hey, we're on a program node. Okay, what can we do? Well, steps property and it's of type two and type two is an array. Okay, so steps is an array. So now you can go into steps and iterate over the nodes in that array. And again, look at the type property and the type property indexes this thing. And you can traverse the AST based on this, uh, this structure definition. Right, so further down I have a piece of code that generates uh, a walker function in JavaScript by reading this definition. So now I don't have to uh, maintain all these tooling uh, walkers. If you look at the Mozilla code base, there's like this ginormous tree walker that is essentially code, you could code generate from, from this definition and a simple function. Um, because I use, I, I, I use maybe four different, I have a copy function, a clone function, uh, a scan function, and a walker. And they're all generated from this. So an AST is nothing but a object structure that re represents your source. It's like a, the parser generates it and it's pretty big. It becomes pretty large for large files. Um, but this is sort of the, the foundation of dealing with your language. And we'll come to that uh, with the code editor uh, soon. Um, but the nice thing is, if your AST is, a, is sort of like this primitive in your language, because in, in OneJS, this backslash means quote, and that means that if I look at, if I console.log style, it'll give me an AST node of this function. Right, so that means that I can symbolically, or I can pass around chunks of AST. So I can pass around chunks of shaders, which are in symbolic form, and then the, and then the shader compiler, which takes this JSON object structure that looks, at th that looks like this code, and then turns it into the string representation that goes to the shader compiler uh, on the GPU. So, uh, Closure and Lisp and all these things all have this to be able to symbolically deal with, uh, with your code. And uh, if you want to compile from within one host language to different targets, you need this, uh, need this construct. Um, so that's how it essentially works. It's just JavaScript with the quote operator so you can define functions on objects that are not really in the JavaScript space, but can be compiled into other spaces like the GPU. Um, now, the cool thing about this AST thing is that it is, uh, it's a very clean representation of your code, right? It's a symbolic structure that you can manipulate and you, and you can write little tools that go, oh, Let's look how many variable definitions are in this scope. Well, you can very simply write a little loop that runs over the steps of a program and picks out all the var nodes and you know iterates over the defs and then picks the ID and the value and then you have them. You don't have to regular expression them out of your source. You traverse the tree and now you have them. So um, ASTs are very useful to do things with the language, like compile or uh, write tooling. Um, and for a code editor, uh, there's a, a, another uh, utility, and that is syntax highlighting, right? All the code editors that I'm aware of, except maybe from some, some Lisp stuff and uh, some other uh, edge cases, but pretty much all of them syntax highlight by just regular expressioning, tokenizing the, the input thing line by line. If you're lucky, it does blocks. That's pretty much it. Just looks at like, hey, is this a number? Well, then it's blue. And if it's uh, uh, something that looks like an identifier, then it's white or whatever. But in this AST, there's this ginormous richness of the structure that allow you to do much more than um, just simple syntax highlighting. As long as uh, you can use that, right? So. One way to syntax highlight from the AST is to parse your code and you have an AST structure. And in that AST structure, you encode the offsets, right? So you say, hey, this var uh, node here, this var node has like the character offset in the source code is 15 to 
17 or 18, right? And then you can take that offset and you can color that blue or green or whatever the color you want for that var, right? So you can use these ranges. But the problem is um, this abstract syntax tree is very lossy. There is a loss of information uh, when you parse source into an AST because all the comments, all the new lines, all these, uh, all the white space essentially uh, gets lost. It's, n it's not encoded in the structure because otherwise, imagine if you would look for a var and it's like var x is, is one and there was a comment in between the is and the one, right? So how, how would you symbolically, how would you navigate that in an abstract sense? Y you would r your, your generic tools would run into like, hey, there's this node here, but it's a comment, so we have to ignore it, right? So you move the problem of ignoring uh, stuff from the parser to all your tooling, and your tooling doesn't like dealing with all, these, all this nonsense, right? That's why the parser throws it away. But if you want to properly syntax highlight from the AST, um, you need to keep that. So that's one of the things that I've been working on because I realized that uh, making a new JavaScript dialect with all these crazy things is, uh, will have some adoption problems. So we need to have a code editor that has the best syntax highlighting and, and support and help you along the way. Now, uh, I have actually uh, spent the last month uh, not working on my code editor, but um, integrating the conceptual space of React into the system. So that's very <laughs> in invisible right now, but I can show you uh, the code editor. Um, so the code editor uh, looks like this. <coughs> Essentially, uh, this is uh, there's a bit, a bit of uh, styling in here, but uh, there's an app tag and, and it has a render function, just like React, and then it, re it returns uh, a scene graph. In this case, it makes a, a root component, and then it dumps in a code editor tag. And this code editor, so um, I'm pretty sure you guys have seen JSX by now and what that represents. Uh, the concept of uh, tags uh, makes sense in JavaScript because JavaScript objects are not, uh, ha don't have a nice mapping to XML, right? There's, there's the problem of children in, uh, in, in XML that's pretty clean, but is not so clean in JSON, right? You have to make an array and, and commas and all that. So uh, that's the cool thing about, you can make JavaScript do anything you want. I gave JavaScript an anonymous uh, object uh, key. So essentially, instead of like, x1, you just do 1. And this treats the object like an array and just does uh, array length plus plus assigned to, uh, to the object, right? So now uh, I can essentially use ma make anonymous child lists using that. So that, that's what this means. This is just, uh, y you could see this as, as this kind of XML, right? Except using a JavaScript syntax. Anyway, so here's the code widget, and um, it has the, the styling in there. And this is a, a new kind of editor, and it looks really very dull, but um, as you see now, uh, I entered only plus, but now the method definition on the next line becomes part of the expression on the top. And if I add another character, it falls back into place, right? Um, this is a code editor that is continuously regenerating itself as I type. So what happens is that I type, and every time I, I do a key press, it throws the whole file in the parser, and the parser generates an AST. And then the AST is reserialized to uh, the buffer format of the editor, which is in this case vertex buffers. Vertex buffers are those little triangles uh, that you uh, that you just saw. Except for text, this one has one has two triangles, and this one has two triangles, and this one has two triangles. So essentially, it's a, like a mesh of of triangles that form. If you texture them with a picture, it forms a code editor, right? So. 
Um, this is not uh, this is not divs. This is not any th anything like that. This is um, um, mesh, and just to show you that this is mesh, right? This is uh, what you could do on your Oculus and look at it in any possible way. And uh, it also has no. It's completely vector. There's no texture, there's no uh, font caches that are invalidated. This is just all evaluated on the GPU, um, right? So here you can see, I'm going to show you what, what the selection can do as well. Um, so rendering on the GPU uh, brings on this new domain of sort of functional graphics. Right, so we have the selection here in the corner, has nice round corners and scales. But how would you define this in SVG, right? You'd make a, a shape path with bejets on the edge, right? That define the curve of this odd shaped rectangle. But you can also say, no, it's a square, but <coughs> we can evaluate at every pixel, the shape, right? So a circle like x, x squared, y squared, square root, the, the, the dis, uh, distance to the center. Um, if you then say to the GPU like, okay, evaluate for every pixel, evaluate that circle, but draw the line at 0.5, it draws an ISO line, right? Like an where is this expression 0.5? Well, then it draws a circle. This is exactly the same except then uh, it's a slightly different equation. It's not a circle, it's a rounded box equation. And the cool thing about uh, doing it like that is that this little gloopiness that you can see here is sort of free. I, didn't, I don't have to generate stuff for this. There's no geometry going on. There's no API calls that make budgets. This is free from evaluating the selection on the GPU, right? Um, so uh, I can show you what happens if I mess with the distance function. So this is because everything in OneJS is sort of in the same code space. All the GPU stuff is in the same code space as JavaScript. Um, this is the marker paint function. It's a little bit tricky function in the sense that um, it's uh, the GPU is very functional, it's, in, in it's practically functional, but it's also very functional in that it doesn't communicate data sideways. It's parallel, but it doesn't communicate data sideways. It streams data in on one end, and then data comes and pixels come out on the other. So that means that if I need to know how to draw this selection at a certain pixel, I need to pass it in the previous and the next selection of a line. So otherwise, it can't draw. It can't eval. It has to evaluate three selections to be able to draw that gloopy thing, right? So I pass in those three selections into a ve into a vector. So the the selection above it, previous, and the selection below it. I pass the x the x range in, and then I evaluate uh, a round box function based on those coordinates. And then you use the uh, simple function, then you use the ISO, surf, ISO line function, uh, which actually makes a little nice anti-aliased gradient at the edge of the, of the function. It's, it's, it's very simple math. But you can also mess with it. Like, do you do that? It's supposed to live reload, right? You just you know, put an animation on the function. And since this is a, an ISO surface field, uh, you could ray trace it or you could do crazy. And it's kind of out of fashion. That's the problem with it. It's kind of out of fashion right now. Everything is flat. Maybe that can change. It's kind of easy when, you, when you're like, I'm doing a UI framework in the flat time, OK. It's easier than the bitmap time back in the day. <laughs> Uh, hold on. Oh, my auto reload is not working. Uh, 
right? Here you can here you can see what I mean when that it's that it's evaluated per pixel, right? I can write any kind of function that does this. Now uh, I only had my uh, train trip over here, um, so I haven't actually moved into um, doing crazy f ray traced uh, stuff here, but um, that will soon happen. Um, so yeah, this is sort of uh, a little sidestep from the editor, uh, but uh, it is one of the consequences of being able to do styling on the GPU. And that there's this field of uh, per pixel evaluated uh, graphics that you can do. And these per pixel evaluated graphics you can parameterize from your app. So for instance, here uh, I have the style function that's running on the GPU for this bit of code, right? So, let uh, me see. Code view, code edit. <coughs> so I showed you the AST. Now, how would you process an AST, or th which is a JSON structure with type blah, type var, type object? How would you expand that into uh, a graphical res representation like this, that uh, in this case the code editor can directly use? Well, uh, you just make a hash table, an object, with uh, functions that are the node types, and then you just write some stuff in those functions, right? Like, um, for instance, A, if we get a value, which is just a value in your code, uh, it's a num it's a, can be a numeric value, it can be a string, and then we call this function uh, with a string, and we pass it some other properties because on the GPU um, <coughs> you can you can pass it data, right? So if I if I pass this this rectangle here, this one with the I, if I pass that to the GPU, uh, what do I pass to the GPU? Well, I pass it the coordinates because otherwise it can't put it on the screen, and I pass it uh, the offsets into a picture map for the I character, so it's sort of like an ASCII code, except it's texture coordinates, right? But you can also pass it all sorts of other data, because those that data ends up in the shader. I can pass it, for instance, the fact that this is, uh, um, I think it's a type, so import is a type. Um, and, uh, you know, this is an identifier, and this is a, uh, something else. So I, I can pass it the AST types straight through to the shader so that the GPU can then have this little function here, I think it's here, which is called every pixel in which, hold on, one, there's, where's it? here's style, every pixel in which it pulls out the data that it's got stuffed into those typed arrays, right? Like, hey, this is an identifier, hey, this is a whatever. It's, it's like you get ASCII plus however many bits of extra data that you want to pass to the render engine, right? It's like ANSI, but custom defined. You can just give it vectors, any type of data you can pass in. In this case, I, I pack together a whole bunch of uh, uh, integers into one float. It's a little trick. Help save space, because you do have to realize that if this file is huge, then this is going to generate about 50 megabytes of data. And every single vector I pass in extra will up it with like 10% every time. So I, I do have to be a little bit careful. Um, and then what you do is you write a little shader that says like, hey, oh, um, well, we're a type var. A type var is the, the thing that, that says here, import math, right? Float, float, t. Now float is a type var. You see, it just got the nice outline is true. Because I can set this per pixel. Let's see if that does that. Right? I can switch outline mode on and off for my font per pixel based on this little expression here. Right? Uh, or I can say, well, let's go crazy. Put some fractal function on there. Oh, I'm so used to auto reload that if it doesn't work, 
my world collapses. <laughs> right? You're like, oh, okay, crazy, useful, not. But <laughs> it illustrates a point. Th this, is, this is the age of programmable styling. Or at least I'm hoping it will be at some point in the future, but I'm trying my very best. Um, because you have to realize that doing this without all this infrastructure of, of JavaScript uh, uh, quotes and, and all these kind of combinations and the fact that uh, my typed arrays, I have structs, so this the, the structural decomposition of this stuff on the JavaScript side and the GPU side is tuned to each other because they use the same structs, right? If you don't have all that, this is so much work that everybody just goes, you know what, we're not going to do that. <coughs> so you have to find a way to make this so easy that, uh, that it becomes accessible. Anyway, um, we were at the AST editor. So this is a bunch of triangles. And every time I type a character, it regenerates the source from AST. And the trick to it is, uh, because, uh, I mean, AST tools have been around and you can use them, but the problem is that if you write a comment, um, if you have a pure AST, the comments are not on there. They're gone. They're just, they just disappear. I can show you that because I have gone, right? There's no point I can annotate this on. Because the AST is an abstract JSON structure or an abstract object structure, I cannot put this anywhere. So unfortunately, you cannot comment there. Maybe I'll find a way to, to fix that. But I have fixed that you can use you know, a comment here or um, oh it's, it's in trippy mode. Um, so T is 10, right? It, it just auto structures that as you type. Now, the key to this is to not make it annoying. So I've spent weeks and weeks and weeks to not make it annoying. And it's almost not annoying. Um, because it tries to auto format, right? And what I've done now is that if it, uh, um, if it reduce, if it removes something that you just typed, it just sort of waits until you move the cursor uh, before it does that. Those kind of little tweaks that you get, sort of. So the there's a there's a line there's an editor that is essentially a line editor as we know a, a big buffer, and it keeps that buffer around. So as soon as the AST says I don't know, you know, like this, it automatically it just completely stops formatting anything, right? <coughs> and as soon as you have it valid, it expands again. Um, now, why am I doing this? Because this sounds like an awful lot of work for just auto formatting. But the key here is that this thing now has an abstract structure. So I can do things like find method and rename identifier in scope and all those kind of difficult questions that you can ask an editor are now all of a sudden trivial because the AST already encodes that in a very easily accessible way. And um, um, that's why I wish I was a little further, but uh, within probably a couple of weeks, um, I will be able to extend this editor with things like uh, you know 3D probes. So if I have a if I have a shader and I put an at sign in there, it can just pop out a little data visualizer that is connected straight to the runtime and render you know little views that you would be very hard pressed to do in HTML, but you can actually do really fast on the GPU. How am I doing on time? Okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not in the habit of timing anything I do usually. <laughs> so I just uh, start and see where I end up. Um, but I kind of covered uh, most of the ground. Um, let's see. When you <coughs> something about your final goal with, uh, with the editor, with your yeah. project or anything. So... Um <coughs> So when you have an AST, 
of your code as you type all the time and it can reserialize your code without destroying it which is kind of the thing right if you have a if you have a rename identifier function and your uh, and your identifier is renamed in the AST and then the editor regenerates from the AST and you lose all your line all your new lines and comments and everything that's not going to be useful right so having the AST in the loop as you type opens up uh, a whole new area of editors, right? You can have like a flow graph editor that is actually just an alternate view on the AST, right? You can have, uh, you know, uh, what is that? That MIT project with the blocks that you can drag and drop with the loops and those kind of things, right? Those kind of views are just views on the data structure. Just like you have a model view controller, you can have a, a different kind of view on your code that uses the abstract structure as its central data point. Uh, and doesn't destroy the code editing experience. So uh, flow graph editors and all these things are always always very annoying because it's it's a projection of code that is not code. Code is more powerful than any flow graph editor, right? They can oh we'll have flow edit and then they'll have like a module you can edit in an editor. But why not have a multimodal editor that has um, an abstract data structure as uh, an AST as its center point? Um, but it can still use the undo stack from the text editor, right? Because it cycles through it. So you can just keep it very simple in that sense. Um, now, of course, that's like part of, because I, I always wanted to make this, I've been wanting to make this editor for like 10 years or something, but you do have to have something to edit, right? I can make this editor for PHP and go like, yeah, that wasn't useful because it just has no, uh, uh, easy data probes that can be connected to the editor at high, f high speed, right? I have to like build 10 miles of plumbing to the PHP runtime or something. I mean, we've, we've played with this with, uh, with V8 and, and, and all these special APIs, but it's much nicer if the editor is like a, a worker away in the same process and you can just pass it a megabyte of typed array by object transfer, right? You can just write a little log loop that writes into the typed array in the process and then just hand it over without copy to the UI and then you can see it. There's so this editor can be very close to the runtime uh, because it has, um, uh, one.js runs in a worker, I don't know if I, I said that, but one.js runs in a worker and it has a render thread and that means that you can live code the, the code in the worker. And if you make an infinite loop there, it's not going to freeze your browser because you can just kill off the worker and start a new one. Um, so I'm aiming for uh, full integration, um, disregarding uh, existing things as much as I can. Not because I want to, but because otherwise I can't do what I want to do. And it's like, OK. Uh, I tried to do this without adding quotes to JavaScript, right? And it's terrible because you cannot sync types between the GPU and the CPU code. <coughs> I tried to, um, um, I, I, I try to uh, do the live coding thing, uh, but you need workers. Otherwise, uh, I mean, you've seen that on Khan Academy, right? They have also run the user code in a worker uh, so that you can make infinite loops and not crash your environment completely. So I need that too. Um, and if you do that, then all of a sudden you need to serialize your rendering over a worker message loop. So <coughs> there you go, incidental complexity. If you want to do this, then you have to do that kind of uh, combination. So I added all that together. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that I want to fix as well. Uh, for instance, uh, if you have an editor that's an AST editor, I can also do content addressable modules. So you can do import hash, and then the editor can make it look pretty, like import blah, blah, blah module something, right? It can, it can pull metadata out of the module and display that as a different string. So if you do that in Vim, it's gonna be really annoying to work with content addressable modules. But if you do that with an editor like this, uh, all of a sudden you can sort of, take leaps in many directions. Um, and uh, uh, what else? So if you have content-addressable modules, then all of a sudden reuse and composition 
of different bits from everybody become much easier, right? So shader toy is like, hey, here's this monolithic file. And somebody copies and pastes it and forks it maybe, but that's it. I can do import. Uh, and then I can do a visual search in stuff I want, and pull it in <coughs> immediately and use that right there, <coughs> right? Um, there's no technical limitation that we can't do that. It's more like, oh yeah, module systems and NPM and yay, you know, it's, it's all incidental, it's not real. Um, and I think if you can do that for graphics and have a multimodal view where there's curves and sliders and, and, and all these kind of things that designers are used to work with and programmers can then write like the really cool freaky fractal shader thingies, whatever you do with them. And you can pull them in, parameterize them, and dump it out on your on your mobile device, live coded on your iPad. That's kind of neat, right? Um, I'm I'm not really uh, aiming to do that in the sense of like, oh, let's make a UI kit for mobile, because then the use cases are going to be Tinder, Tinder, uh, Facebook app, text form, you know and probably <coughs> Minecraft. So it's, it's like, I would like to aim this at a bigger kind of application for digital design, like for instance, electronic circuit board design, because that really could use the GPU uh, and you shouldn't use the DOM tree to represent I mean, if you try to look at FPGA circuit board and SVG, that's not gonna work, you know? So it, it, it needs this kind of stuff. And then there's interactive, uh, right? I mean, have you seen the Stop Animating Dead Fish or something? Brett Victor video? Uh, like, use the medium, right? So there's this whole opportunity to create a new medium that is not Flash and that is not uh, a book. And, you know, there's, but that, is exists out of uh, procedural design. Procedural design is a programmer makes a procedure and an artist tweaks it until it's pretty. That's a whole field that's completely unexplored. So, does that explain? It's a direct, yeah. It's a direct, I mean, I, I'm r and <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. This is gonna be the way I like it. And um, it's, um, but I, I do think it's a, it's, it, it can be interesting. And uh, I, I also hope that uh, um, this will seep into different areas of the browser as well. It's kind of making quite some people will act on this. Yeah, that's cool. Is yeah. any of this open source? Everything's open source. Everything is Apache, <coughs> which is the best open source. Uh, Apache 2, I think. And uh, everything, I, I always put it on, on, on GitHub. And I tweet uh, every random thought I have. So, <laughs> um, yeah, no. If it, th the only thing is that I can change the syntax tomorrow, and you can't complain. That's my only disclaimer <laughs> because I just did that. I just changed the syntax last week um, because, as you can see in these slides, I used the semi the colon for symbolic, <laughs> and uh, after I put in. Uh, the React construct, I needed that thing to be, um, so x colon 1 means self.x is 1. So I added an extra kind of this, that's called self, very confusing, but not really. Um, essentially, you have to look at an object literal as a space where self is now defined as the object itself. Right, so instead of this is like sort of the the instance in a method, and self is the class or object scope. Right, so class T self is now the the, the T. It's the class T. Right, and x colon one means self dot x is one. So now you've sort of fused object literals with executable object bodies. And that's really, really, really useful because almost everything I have is an executable object body. Because if you look at this construct, I think it's already and it's in ES6, but what is not in ES6? 
uh, not in here, not not already in here. I think this might not be right. Um, if I do this in an object literal in my language, I have to transcompile this to something which probably turns this into a function where I pass the object in and turns method into self dot method this function, right? So. Um, Transcompiling ES6 to ES5 already creates in the in the in the compatibility layer executable function bodies. I just said, you know what? Let's generalize that and use the colon as uh, as a context-free self dot x assign, and then you can do all sorts of really neat things, which includes um, making XML syntax in JavaScript objects. So that's why I needed my uh, colon back. And then I changed the syntax, because I don't care. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, soon this will be uh, sort of an online live coding shader toy kind of thing. And you can use it for anything you want if, it, if it's useful to you. Um, but uh, it's, pretty com it's a relatively complicated piece of kit. It's a type inferencing compiler. So the shaders need types, right? So here you see vec4m is tag mesh. Uh, I could actually replace this with var because the compiler actually inferences the type based on what you put on the right-hand side. Um, so I don't know. Th there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, but if you're interested, I would love to, you know, you can also um complain about it and tell me how bad it is and I would I would definitely be interested in uh, in people bitching about it but uh, it's a little bit early uh, I wonder how, how is this related to the uh, ACE code editor and uh, did you did you already think about uh, how to deal with a uh, large uh, amount of text uh, with, with this uh, technique yes. Uh, so, um, it is not a virtual viewport editor that's running in a different thread and has a completely different syntax highlighter. So I could find nothing to reuse. Um, but I really looked at it. But ACE has a different design scope. It's a multi-language, multi-paradigm HTML editor with a virtual viewport. Mm -hmm. This is a single language, uh, AST syntax highlighted, uh, different threading model, shader styled editor so um, I started that on key press okay. right. yeah it's a uh, I, I, I really tried but it's a uh, um, I have a fairly I have a limited capacity to absorb other people's code it like derails me for a month right like react absorb okay well I'm gonna stare at the ceiling for a month right it's um, but that I really, but that I did because I think React is, uh, hit a very important thing. Because I always was like, oh, here you have a render engine, and the rest is left as an exercise to the reader, which turns out to be then you create really bad UI structures. You, it's yeah, all the problems that you see they explain when Facebook showed React, those you run into. So I thought it would be a good idea not to leave it as an exercise to the reader. Um, so now I have this. Now I have uh, the same component model with a render function and you can spit out uh, scene graph nodes that will be diffed uh, when, uh, when you re-render re them and execute them. So you can use the, the init, is, uh, init is update paradigm, which I think is the most powerful concept. Um, but other than that, this thing is JavaScript compatible because I didn't break JavaScript. I mean, not too badly, right? If you, <laughs> if you, if you like doing this, this is a function call, then no, then it won't work, right? This is one of those blow your, this is why JavaScript people say you need semicolons because this blows your foot off, right? If you have this, this thing here and then at a certain point you have like something or other between parentheses now it becomes a function call. And that's why they go, oh no, you have to put a semicolon there. 
I just say this is no longer a function call. Yeah. So I fix certain things, but other than that, it's still. Oh, and and uh, um, because I needed the semicolon, uh, the very rarely used um, what are they called again? Labels. You can go to and like jump out of loops with labels. I need to find like I don't know, you know, some other syntax for that, but. I don't think the, the I think I don't th I think it's important enough to warrant like your primary colon assignment. So um, yes, any questions ever? Yeah. So you talked about or like you you're using ASCs and you were talking about your visual representation of the code that actually in the editor. Yes. Um, did you also also think about like storing compressed code instead of the code that? the users actually seeing? Explain. Well, so you talked about that like comments and new line or like white space in general is not necessary. Yes. And because you're interpreting your code, you can easily store it without white space, for example. Yes. Or without comments. Like, did you think about that? Or did you think about like storing it in a different format? Well, um, I'm going to store it uh, with wi white space and comments, but I use tops because I don't see the point of spaces, especially not when I can control the editor. Um, but other than that, um, you can change, for instance, the fact that this thing has a, has a space here. That's a style, and I can show you how to change that. Uh, let's see, go to text mark, then I go to you. Uh, it's in function, function, function. Uh, where's the body? Expand body. Uh, so, space? where's the space? Here, L space. There you go. Right, so your code style is configurable. And as long as it parses, I don't really care how you store it. Um, <coughs> so, no. So if you move recursion now, you got a double stop between the press. And I got what? You have to press. Does it also mean to move the character in your in your buffer that you don't have to press left two times? To yeah, I, I I try to I try to be smart about that without being annoying. That's uh, the really hard part, right? So check this backspace removes the is. So it tries to sort of balance the character you type with the backspace because otherwise you know how your how your your motor neurons go, right? You type and you type you, your backspace command is already in your motor queue before you actually saw what happened. So that means that you do not you, 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 it, it'll be it'll be horrible. So that's why I try to sort of mirror keystrokes and not per se visual. But I'm sure it'll be annoying at some point. <laughs> this is also mean that like when you're loading a different library that's not formatted as specified in your code, it will completely reformat. Yes, it will just reformat everything. So I can just like take this and paste it here. Right. And like paste it here, right? <coughs> it'll aut it auto formats uh, based on where I paste it. Why? You never see it. <laughs> no. I can configure it to look anything I like uh, how I like it, you know, sort of. I c uh, if you don't like spaces there, and or, or I like spaces after, I don't like spaces after if, or you do. It's just like, you know, putting a, making it configurable, and now, now it's there. So it seems to be like the best way to work with other people. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's why I'm not going to use git. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. for, for this I am, but for not, not for my module system. But I don't know. Yes? So, so you said that uh, you know the actual representation that the editor is using internally is the AST. And every time you type a character, it uh, reparses and regenerates the AST. Yes. Why are you even looking at the text content anymore? Why isn't that just like a serialization detail when you save it on the disk? Um, because 
text as to AST is a very nice compressed format. You have to look at the parser as a decompressor, essentially, sort of. It's decompressing code into a structure. So it's a very nice compressed format that people can read. So it's nice. Uh, no, no I, I mean, I understand why you'd want to save it like that, but uh, um, some of those problems like you described with the editor, for example. That oh, oh, right. Max spaces and, and if the thing is, we are so used to line editors. Mm -hmm. If I turn this into an actual structure editor, yeah. they've tried this in 2000. So all these people are like, yeah, we're going to make AST editors. And then they've realized that, what do you do now? If you can answer that question, you can make an AST editor. Because I don't know what to do. Because what do you want to do? You want to like remove the whole block? Now this is no longer now, now this thing changes based on now it's no longer a, a method definition, but now it's a call, right? So AST, uh, parsers are state machines, right? And they encode the parsing logic in this tremendously large, uh, relatively complicated thing. And if I have to sort of pull that out in some abstract way to to modify based on this little change, right? Now it's a method definition and now it's a call. I'm going to be like 450 years and not done. Hold on. With the problem. Because the amount of permutations that the parser holds in relation to what you can do with your keyboard to mess it up is huge. And if you can't do this, people go, it's not doing what I want. I don't like it. Well, now it's a line editor. Line yeah. now it's a line editor, and so it's it's simply the the AST uh, regeneration cycle stops. And the AST regeneration cycle is also pretty smart, right? Oh, not that smart. But what it does is it, it regenerates, and then it does a very fast top bottom diff to only find the segment that has changed, and then edits the vertex buffer, uh, and generates actually an undo state, right? So here I can show you. Wow, my selection is horrible now, but right. You can see that the non-formatted case is in my undo buffer as an edit. So the, the reformats actually enter the undo buffer as an edit. thought that was less annoying. Um, yeah, I imagine like it flips so in some way that you don't want and you don't get the chance to fix it. <laughs> so is this editor one big project or are parts of the pluggable uh, or extracted as modules? Oh, it's all very, I, I mean, I really try to modularize, but it's all in one JS. So it's all like coffee script, you know, it has, um, uh, so the editor is, uh, is I actually have, I have, have, have it separated in an editor. So I have like an edit implementation and then I have, uh, I don't know, maybe it's not the most pretty model, but then you have a uh, uh, code edit. Where's my widget? Is this my widget? So it's now just one big toolkit. Right, here you just load the edit implementation and it's just, it's a mix in. It just throws the editor in there. And if you want like a little combo box edit widget, then you use the same edit impl. Uh, but then you don't put in syntax highlighters and all that. So I try to sort of make interfaces for my text handling thing. So I can actually switch between a chunked text handler and a single block text handler, which it makes sense for the GPU, right? A single block is like a one typed array. But if that's too inefficient, for instance, if it's 1500 lines, then you have to like chunk it like Google Google Maps, right? You have to to chunk it. And um, so, but uh, it, I mean, it's internal, um, but I, I really try. Uh, but maybe I find some prettier ways to do this than mix-ins. Um, but, uh, that's generally how I do it. You make a class and you just dump a whole bunch of methods on it and then you just load it into another one, like a mixin. I think React does that too and many of those others, but um, you can't use it in, in any meaningful way because it's built onto a compiler that's built into this. So, um, yeah, I don't know what you could reuse from this. What would you want? I mean, you can take the... the, the Yeah, except the only problem is 
that I need my, my inline, I, I want to expose the GPU to parameterize from your button clicks, right? You want to click on a button, change a value, and then use that value directly in the shader to, I don't know, ray trace something differently, right? You parameterize your shaders. And so uh, I really try. I wanted to make this library, but I can't. Sorry. Thank you for 